It's my great pleasure to, uh, to welcome everyone to attend this year's uh, Zygmunt Calderon Lectures. Um, there have been, this, this has been a lecture series that has been around for um, at least 30 years. Um, it originally was the Zygmunt Lectures and then um, it later uh, in incorporated as well Alberto Calderon. Um, as part of its uh, title, these uh, these two gentlemen were both uh, extremely um, significant analysts. I mean, they're well known for their individual work, their joint work. Uh, both of them had received the National Medal of Science and the Steel Prize. Um, I, not to mention things that they've done individually that each, um, you know, uh, besides the thing that they have in um, in common. Uh, uh, they are really the founders of analysis here at University of Chicago. We do our best to continue the tradition that they established. Um, um, it's at times like this that we uh, think about the past and we uh, look back to the really excellent lecturers who have given this uh, in the past. And uh, I'm in that setting, I therefore want to uh, invite uh, Camilo Delilla. Uh, Delellis to give us today's lecture. Camilo is at the Institute for Advanced Study. Um, he's worked on a number of things. Today he's picking a, fair, a geometric um, topic um, on minimal surfaces, at, uh, least area surfaces. And, um, and anyway, let me just uh, ask Camilo to start. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's uh... A great honor, actually, to uh, to give this series of three lectures. I would have uh, liked to be there in person, but we all know the reasons why uh, that is at the moment not possible. And um, so thank you for coming to the lectures. And uh, without further ado, let me start um, um, with um, an overview of the topic. So this first uh, lecture, as I've been explained, um, should be for the general audience. And it will be for the general audience. The second and third lecture will be uh, somewhat more um, uh, specialized. I mean, it, I will go into somewhat more details, but 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 not that that much. I mean, like even the second or third lectures will stay at a fairly general level. Okay, so what I'm um, what we're going to talk about um, is um, uh, today is the classical plateau problem. Um, uh, of which. I'm going to take a fairly general um, formulation, even though the initial formulation of plateau was much more specific. So we have a given contour gamma, and let's say this given contour is m minus one dimensional. So let me call it a contour. Um, and this contour is in some Riemannian manifold. Let me call it sigma with some metric G, over which I will have some reasonable assumption so it's sufficiently smooth. You might imagine it's compact, complete, something like that. So I don't want to be too specific. So let me just, for the sake of simplicity, aim smooth and complete. Okay, and what I'm looking for are m, m, m dimensional surfaces which I will call T with the property that these surfaces span gamma in some sense and for this sense, we will write that the boundary of T is equal to gamma. And T minimizes the m-dimensional volume. OK, so for, for I mean, like, I, I can actually do so. You can uh, everything that I'm going to tell you is valid in a general Riemannian manifold with some um, ambient metric which is sufficiently smooth uh, and a manifold which is complete. And I could actually be detailed about the assumptions, but 
For the sake of simplicity, since um, it doesn't add actually much to the difficulty of the problem, let us say that for what I'm interested in, you can easily imagine that sigma is just a Euclidean space of dimension m plus n. And of course, g is just a standard metric. OK, you, you see that for two numbers, which will play actually a very important role in the last of the lectures, and n is going to be the co-dimension of the, of the surface t. while m is the dimension of t. OK, and, and this will always be what I refer to when we are talking about dimension and co-dimension. OK, so now um, in, in order to, um, to actually state um, uh, some theorem or to you know, like, like formulate mathematically in a precise way, um, what, what uh, the problem is, what the variational problem is, I have to tell you um, how I define the m-dimensional volume, how I define my surface t, and how I define my surface gamma. So for the rest of the talk, I'm just going to assume the following. So gamma is a smooth surface. OK. so. You don't have to worry too much about this, uh, but what I actually want to highlight over here is that it might be taken with multiplicity, which I will specify what that means. OK, what is t? So t is what, in the language of geometric measure theory, is called a uh, m-dimensional current with coefficients in some group. Now, this is like the technical definition, but what I really mean by this is the following. So first of all, the group is going to be either z so the uh, usual integers, or it's going to be z modulus p. Okay, so which I will just call z p. Okay, and what do I understand by a current? So here, I just understand the following. So first of all, um, I, I, I can define like um, what are the usual, uh, what are called usually as chains with coefficient in my group. So that is, of course, going to be the group G. And this I do in the following way. So I take a formal sum. So for yi equal 1 to k. Then I take coefficients in my, in my group. So I can take number gi's. OK, and then I take just pieces of surfaces or, 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 or nice orientable surfaces with boundaries, OK? So here, I just take what I will call, say, lambda i. So what are these lambda i? So lambda i is an m-dimensional surface. So lambda i is an m-dimensional surface. Um, which is C1, so C1 surface, with C1 boundary. OK, in the classical sense. And actually, I, would, I should even say over here, C1 oriented surface. OK? And now you see that I have these coefficients gi. So what I'm actually understanding over here is just the following. So these gi's, they're just integer in one case. So this, they might belong to Z, OK? Or otherwise, they're actually elements in ZP. And what I'm actually going now to do is I'm going to define the boundary of this guy. So if this is equal to T. So in general, I'm going to define the boundary of this guy as this formal sum.
Okay, but so now here I have actually to pay attention somehow what, what I, do I understand by this formal sum over here. So if it actually happens that this lambda i and lambda j have say a non-empty intersection, um, if they actually intersect on a, on, a, on a set of positive m dimensional volume, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually sum the coefficients over all those pieces and uh, once I sum, for instance, what might happen is that the sum of those coefficients is equal to zero uh, in my group, okay? And in that case, of course, I identify that uh, um, with the zero, uh, uh, with the zero cavern. So pay attention. So it might happen. So it might happen that pieces and this writing cancel out. So what do I mean by this? So for instance, what I could do is the following. So I could take as um, G um, Z3, right? I could take actually three segments, all counted with multiplicity one. And let me say just that I orient them in this way. And you see that when I'm actually going to, uh, so, so this would be like lambda one, lambda two, and lambda three. And so now the G, I are all going to be equal to one. And what happens when I actually compute the boundary of this cavern T? Well, I have like a point P3 over here, a point P2, a point P1, and then you see that I have a central point Q. So what is going to happen is that I'm just going to see the sum for I equal one to three of um, say uh, uh, the um, manifolds which are given by the points P, I. Uh, but at the central point Q, what I'm just going to see is like the, the point Q with multiplicity three, but three is identified with zero in my group. And so therefore I'm not going to have anything else, right? So here, what I would see formally is like three Q and maybe I should put actually a minus over here, but actually that cancels out mod P. So this is kind of disappears because we are mod three. Okay, so this is what I understand. And now what do I understand as a mass? So now the M dimensional volume um, of, of, of this object of T, right? I would like actually to take it something like uh, the sum for I equal one to K of say some modulus of my uh, coefficients gi times the m dimensional volumes of the various pieces. Okay, this is what I would like to take uh, as a definition of mass, but this is not okay because it does not take into account for cancellations. Okay, and what I really want to do is like, if I have no cancellation, I want to take that as um, a volume of T. And this is by the way, usually called the mass of the cavern T. And there is a procedure of actually formally defining this mass of T, which takes into account the possibility of cancellations. In some sense, you can represent your current in several ways. And what you can take is the infimum of the mass that I write in that way, overall possible representations. So I don't want to be too formal, but, 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 but you can, so uh, you, you can define uh, mass of T in such a way that you account for possible cancellations. Okay, so this is just what you, I mean, how you define somehow nice uh, chains, but then you want to actually make a complete metric space out of this. So, so now assume that you have a sequence. So now assume to have a sequence. Of nice objects, Ti. Um, so chains with coefficients in, in G, 
and assume that you have actually a uniform control over the mass of the i and the mass of the boundary of the i. Okay, so then um, uh, there is a theorem by Federer and Fleming which tells you that, oops, so there is a theorem by Federer and Fleming which tells you that in appropriate subsequence, of the i converges to a suitable general object over which you can extend both the definition of boundary and the definition of mass in such a way that the letter is semi-continuous under this convergence. Okay, and, and so the Federer and Fleming theorem actually comes with a very precise description of what these possible limits could be. And I can't be whatever, uh, whatever you want. So for instance, in the case of Z, so in the case of say Z, the possible limit are called integral currents and they have a certain structure. Okay, and by the way, this is like a theorem which dates back to the sixties. Okay, so now that you have actually this framework, what you can do, well, now you can use the direct methods of the calculus of variations. So by the direct methods of the calculus of variations, you can minimize the mass of T over all such generalized object such that the boundary of T is equal to a coefficient G times your smooth boundary gamma. Okay, so you fix gamma, you actually assume, you, 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 you choose a coefficient G in your group, and then you can minimize for the mass among all surfaces T, which, um, which, which span the given boundary. So this gives you a, 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 at least one, when, one well-defined minimizer. There can be actually more than one minimizer because this is a, a, a nonlinear problem. And so you get examples of this. And what I'm now interested in uh, for the rest of the talk is how regular is this, um, is this um, minimizer? So how regular is the minimizer? or is a minimizer since there can be more than one. And I will split the regularity theory, the theorem into uh, the regularity theory into at least two big sub areas. So first of all, in the interior and in the interior, I mean away from your fixed boundary gamma and two at the boundary gamma. And now, of course, when I'm actually asking the second question here, since I can hope actually that your surface at the boundary gamma is more regular than what gamma is itself to start with. So if you take somehow a gamma, which is very bad, your minimizer can be better than that gamma. I'm actually going to assume in this case that gamma is sufficiently regular. So under the assumption that gamma is smooth. Okay, so there's 
So there are, there are several uh, very interesting theorems and um, several uh, um, very interesting open problems still. But I just want to distinguish also the situation into um, uh, two broad categories. So the lucky situations. And I will be more precise on why we consider actually these situations lucky, but in the lucky situations, for instance, there are the, 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 follow, the following ones. So the coefficient group is G, is Z. So we are, calling, we are talking about integral currents and the co-dimension is one. So this is a lucky situation. And another lucky situation is that the coefficient g is z2 or z3, and the codimension is any. Okay, and then there are the unlucky situations, and the unlucky situations are easy to summarize because it's pretty much anything else. Okay, anything else. Oh, and by the way, so these are lucky situations in, in, in the interior, okay? So then I will discuss how there are lucky situations at the boundary too, but the, but, 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 but the, um, the description is much more um, complicated. Okay, so let me, look at, um, let me look at what I mean by this. So first of all, um, in the regularity theory, there's, um, um, so there's one very, very important and fundamental tool, which is called monotonicity formula. Okay, and I'm just going to actually state the monotonicity formula at the interior. There's a, a, a equal, I mean, a similar monotonicity formula at the boundary, but the interior, the monotonicity formula simply reads in the following way. So uh, let me say that I have a T, which is a minimizer. Okay, and let me look at the following. So let me look at the mass of your minimizer T. Now I have to tell you how I actually chop a minimizer or you know a general current uh, in, in such a way that I localize, say, the intersection of this current with a given ball. So this would be like taking the intersection of the surface with a given ball. So now this is usually called the restriction. So this would be like the intersection of my surface if I had a smooth surface with the ball of radius r. OK, so I, 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 I take this mass. So the volume of what is actually included in the ball of radius R centered at X. And I redivide by R to the M. Well, R to the M is just modulo constant, the uh, M dimensional volume of the unit disk um, in, in an M dimensional uh, uh, subspace, linear subspace of my uh, Euclidean space. Okay. And what is happening is that if this ball of radius R X does not intersect my surface gamma, which is actually the, the interior, uh, the uh, uh, radial, I mean, the, the, the R derivative of this quantity is bigger or equal than zero. Or in other words, um, this quantity is monotone increasing. So, and why is this actually very, very, very interesting? So this is very interesting because it tells us a, as a corollary, the following. So when I zoom in, So when I zoom in, which means when I take my current T, and I intersect it with the ball of radius Rx, move X to the origin, and rescale the radius r homothetically to, uh, to, uh, to the radius r equal one. So um, make an homotity of ratio or of um, dilating factor one over r, okay. 
So then this rescale current, so call it say TXR. So this rescaled object locally converges again to a minimizer because we, we this, 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 uh, this um, uh, monotonicity formula will tell you that I have under control the mass on the, on the unit ball, but not only it converges up to subsequences to a minimizer, the final minimizer is going to have this um, uh, ratio over here, which is constant. And what actually the monotonicity formula also tells you in the proof is that if this ratio is constant, then the current T must be a cone with vectors X. So what I actually learned is that up to subsequences when I make this rescaling, so up to subsequences when I rescale, So TXR converges to a cone. OK, and what is this? Why is this actually a very interesting piece of information? Well, because the cone has one dimension less compared to uh, the surface I started with. So if I were looking at the two-dimensional surface, which is or two-dimensional minimizer, and I make this rescaling, at the point, the limits of the rescalings actually have to converge to a two-dimensional cone. And the two-dimensional cone, uh, I can describe through its cross-section, which is going to be a one-dimensional object. So, so hopefully, this allows some classification. of the possible rescalings. OK, and um, it's not really true. It does not uh, allow for a classification, but it allows actually at least for some description of what might happen. And you can distinguish like two situations. So there's an, a situation one, which is like, you know, possibly points of regularity. So this the situation one is that the limits, or at least one limit, of these possible rescalings is, in fact, the simplest possible cone. And the simplest possible cone is an m-dimensional plane with some given multiplicity. OK, and then there is another situation which is less lucky. And that is that there are limits, so some limits are cones which are not flat, so which are not planar. OK, and why I have actually this suggestive S over here? Well, because you know a posteriori one interesting thing, and that is if I knew in advance that this, that this object T were actually a smooth surface, a smooth embedded surface, uh, then at every point X where I actually do this rescaling procedure, what I'm going to see in the limit of this rescaling procedure is just the tangent space to that particular surface, right? So I'm like zooming into a regular point, and I'm going actually to see a, 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 a the tangent space to my regular surface at that, that point. So the only situation in which S might happen is if you've picked up a point X at which actually your surface is not regular. Okay, so if S happens, the surface is not regular. OK, so therefore, where S happens, actually, you just have a formation of singularities. On the other hand, what you could still hope is that even though your surface is not regular, your cone 
at least has some type of regularity. For instance, say your cone maybe has just a singularity at the, at the tip of the cone, but it has a smooth cross section. And what you can hope is that in a neighborhood, in a sufficiently small neighborhood of my point X, the cone that you found is a model for the singularity. OK? So here, however, you can hop. that your cone at x and beware actually this is like you know a a, a uh, definitely already when i'm telling you your cone at x it seems i'm implicitly assuming that your cone is unique at that point x this is not at all what my corollary actually guarantees you because there is this up to subsequences and it's a big open problem to actually say that you know for the general situation, you don't have to pass to subsequences. At any rate, I mean, if you, for instance, uh, uh, know for some reason that your cone at that point X is unique, you might actually hope that that is a singularity model for your surface in a sufficiently small neighborhood. of your point X. OK, so now actually before coming to that, let me tell you what is like the, 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 the best new that you have. OK, so very good news. So there's a general tool, which is called Algorithm stratification. Which is. A, a, an elaboration of what initially was uh, uh, an ingenious idea by Federer, which is called Federer's reduction argument. So this is a precursor. And uh, uh, which has been improved recently by Naber and Valtorta. OK, but, but anyway, this algorithm stratification essentially tells you the following. So you can, say, classify the point x or the points x where s happen by taking the largest degree of, homoge of homogeneity of a tangent cone uh, x at that point. OK, so by taking the largest degree of homogeneity of the tangent cones at s. OK, so this is going to be an integer because the degree of homogeneity of the tangent cone is defined as the maximal dimension, uh, I mean, the, the, the dimension of the maximal linear subspace under which the cone is invariant. So for instance, if your cone is going to be something like this, then the maximal subspace is going to be just a zero dimensional subspace. But if your cone looks like you know, something like this, then uh, your maximal degree of homogeneity, of course, is one. So this one is always an integer. So this integer, let me say, is k. And then you can, you can say that if the largest integer uh, uh, is k, then x belongs to the stratum sk. And this uh, um, um, stratification by algorithm is a theorem which tells you that SK is a set of Hausdorff dimension no larger than K.
Okay, and so now what is happening therefore is that if it were true that this condition S over here captures all the possible singular points, in some sense, you have a stratification of the points in your surface given by uh, uh, the dimension, I mean, this dimension K, which you have over here, and K equal to M, which is the uh, dimension of the, of, the, of the initial surface, means you, that you have at least one tangent cone, which is invariant under translation in uh, um, uh, along an M-dimensional space, which means that you are actually in the situation of R. And so anything else which is not in the situation of R must have dimension at most M minus one. But not only that, if for some reason you're able to, exclu the, to exclude cone, which are too homogeneous. So for instance, if you can exclude cone, which have degree K equal M minus one, which happens in a lot of situations, then you can even say that the first time that you see a point X, which belongs to S, uh, is on a set of dimension integer, which is even less or equal than M minus one. So this like tells you something interesting. So as a consequence, so as a very important consequence, this tells you, so if, All the points where R occurs, so where you have at least one tangent cone which is flat, are regular, are really regular points. Okay, then the singular set. has dimension at most m minus one. And in fact, maybe even smaller if you're able to, uh, to get some information on all the, on, 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 on like what are like the conical solution of your problem. Okay, so, what are the situations that I identified as lucky? So lucky situations at the interior. So the lucky situation at the interior are the situations in which you have enough information to say that in fact, this condition is correct. So all the points where you see a flat tangent are actually regular. So let me call this condition L. So in the lucky situation at, in, 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 uh, in the interior, so L implies regularity or S, uh, sorry, or R somehow. So the existence of a flat tangent cone implies regularity in a neighborhood of the point. Okay. So, and why actually this is why 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 the situations that I um, that I um, um, that, that I identified are so uh, uh, allows for this. Okay. So let me take for instance the the um, the group G is equal to Z, and the co-dimension is one. Okay, so then this was observed first by De Giorgi. So in this case, what you can actually do is the following. So you can think about your surface. So your co-dimension surface, co-dimension one surface. You can think about it as the boundary of a set. Well, not quite because the boundary of set is always multiplicity one. So, but what is, what, is, uh, what is actually going to happen is that you can rewrite them as a sum of the boundaries 
of sets. And what is, what is going to happen is that if you actually have such a writing, each of the boundaries, I mean, each boundary of the set, so this is, of course, locally. This I should have said. So, and if you actually have this property, what is going to happen is that each, each such boundary must be smooth. Uh, must must have this property that uh, must be area minimized. Okay, and now when you actually have a, a, a point in your set at the boundary of your set where you have a flat tangent cone, what you can in fact prove is that in the limit, when you rescale, your set is converging to half of the space. And so your boundary is actually converging to a single interface, which is like telling you uh, on which side of the, I mean, on which side most of the set actually lies. OK. So what you actually discover under this is that you can reduce. So the upshot is. The situation is lucky because what you can actually identify is in the simplified situation is because you can identify the coefficient of your tangent cone or of your tangent plane to be equal to 1. OK. And why the situation of Z2 or Z3 is lucky in any co-dimension? Well, that is lucky because, remember, my flat tangent cone, so a flat tangent cone, is of the form say, g times your m-dimensional plane pi, where g is an element of the group. And somehow now the group z2 actually is extremely lucky because g is either 0, in which case I'm not seeing anything, or is equal to 1. And if g is an element of 3, then g is either 1 or minus 1 or 0. And minus 1 just is equivalent to flip the orientation of my surface. So somehow what is, what, is, what is going to be lucky is that even in this case, the multiplicity of the tangent cone is actually going to be equal to 1. So g is then either 0 or 1. In the trivial case, 0 is not of interest. That is in z2. Or g is actually minus 1, 0, or 1. And that is in the case of z3. OK. So therefore, what is actually happening is that, first of all, you have angle stratification theorem, which tells you, hey, um, at a substantial amount of points, you're actually going to see at least one tangent cone, which is planar. And then you have this fact that this tangent, this, this tangent cone is taken with multiplicity one. OK, and there is a far-reaching theorem which holds in, in, in a lot of generality, even just for surfaces which are stationary. And when you actually go to stationary, all the objects is called Allard's uh, regularity theorem, which tells you that if a tangent cone is flat and has multiplicity one, So if a tangent cone at some point x is flat and there's multiplicity 1, then 
um, your area minimizing surface or your stationary object for the area functional is actually a C1 submanifold. Okay, so what happens actually in the unlucky situation? So here is what happens in the unlucky situations. The multiplicity one conclusion is false. So the multiplicity one conclusion is false. Okay, and then two, even more dramatically, there are points where the uh, uh, where 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 you find flat tangent cones with higher multiplicity. And these points are actually singular points. Okay, so let me give you the two uh, the two most striking examples. So the first one is in higher co-dimension. So the first one is a two-dimensional surface in R4 which I'm going to identify as C times C. Okay, so if I use complex coordinates, this two-dimensional surface is given by ZW such that Z square is equal W to the power three. And okay, so this is actually an algebraic, uh, uh, um, this is actually an algebraic curve, an holomorphic, algebra, an, an, an holomorphic curve, which is even algebraic. So. It's actually a very, very nice um, uh, surface. It's the zero of a polynomial. Nonetheless, the point zero, so the origin, is singular. In the sense of differential topology, this means in the neighborhood of the origin, there is no system of coordinates in which I can actually look at my surface as a graph of a function. Nonetheless, when I actually apply a rescaling procedure, so a rescaling procedure say by by um, or, uh, um, in in uh, around zero of a factor one over r gives you the following surface so it gives you the surface R squared Z squared is equal to R cubed W to the power three. And as you can see, of course, you can simplify this to Z squared equal to R W to the power three. And when you send R to zero, you will see that you're actually converging to the surface, which is Z squared equals zero. Okay, so which is a plane, but which will be counted with multiplicity two. Now, this, this thing that you can see that for every w uh, coming from the surface over here, you have two solutions of the equation z squared equal r w to the power three. So for every w, which is different from zero. So you have like two points sitting on top of the, of the, um, of the um, uh, uh, point zero w, right? So this has two solutions. Okay, so this is example one, and this is out of, uh, I mean, the fact that we know that this one is area minimizing. So let me call this surface T. So there is a theorem by Federer 
which actually tells you that this T is area minimizing if the coefficient group is Z. Okay, so that's one example. There is another example, and the second example is in codimension one. So let us let us look at R3. Okay. And now in R3, I look at the following surface. My surface T is the following. So my surface T is the union of a plane. So let me say the plane X3 equals zero. And then a smooth graph, which is a smooth solution of the minimal surface equation. So X3 equal F of X1, X2. Okay, where F solves the minimal surface equation. Which is equal to this. Okay, now, no matter what solution of the minimal surface equation F you actually choose, this locally is an area minimizing current mod four. This is a theorem by Brian White. So the surface is area minimizing mod four. So here I have to take as a coefficient group Z4. And what is now happening is that if I choose F in such a way that F of zero is equal to zero, and the gradient of f of zero is equal to zero, then again, when I actually make a rescaling of the, of the Cardan T in the neighborhood of the origin, I see in the limit two copies of the plane x, uh, x3 equals zero. But I will not get actually something regular. I will not get something which is an embedded surface. Of course, I can say that you know the surface is immersed because I can uh, decompose it as the graph of the um, uh, uh, function f equal, uh, so x3 equal f and x3 equal zero. So it's not that bad. Nonetheless, it's not going to be like, you know, one single smooth surface. Okay, so these two examples actually show you what might go wrong in the unlucky situation. And now there's a dramatic drop. So uh, again, you can invoke another version of Allard's theorem. And under these situations, in the unlucky situation, so what you really can actually show is that your surface T is regular on a dense open set. OK, but this is, of course, very, very far from what you would actually conclude in the lucky situation in which you're able to give a bound on the singular set. So in this case, uh, what you actually know is that the singular set is um, 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 a, a nowhere um, uh, a, set, a closed set with empty interior. But of course, the dimension of the surface T is M, and this uh, uh, closed set can actually be very large. OK? So what is happening then in these situations? Well, in these situations, it happens actually that you have to work much, much harder, but you can still say something. So first of all, uh, there is a theorem in the 80s by Angren. And it says, well, nonetheless, even in the unlucky situation in which the coefficient group is Z and the codimension is bigger or equal than two, well, the singular set um, has dimension at most m minus two, but what is really, really relevant for our discussion is simply a like most more important theorem of which this one is just a corollary, which says that the points or the singular points of the current T where you see 
a flat tangent cone are very few. OK? So for instance, a stronger version of this theorem, which would be in 1988, and was proved by Chung, is that if G is equal Z, again, and the dimension is equal to two, then such points are in fact isolated. Okay, so now this is actually very, very nice, but there is a catch. So Almer's proof at the time was around 2,000 pages. In fact, it was around 1,700 typewritten pages. Okay, and in fact, Chunk's proof is strictly, strictly speaking not complete. Well, because if you actually read the paper, what it happens is that there's like 90 pages proof of something, assuming the existence of a certain object. And the existence of that certain object would require you to read the 1,700 pages of the book of Algren and make appropriate modification to prove its existence. Okay, so first of all, in a series of works by um, myself and um, Emmanuel Espadaro, um, say between essentially 2007 and let's say, uh, well, no, it's a little bit later than that. So between 2009 and 2014, what we have been able to do is give, so say a simpler proof. So it's not really a theorem because it's actually the same theorem as Angren, but let's say a simpler proof of Angren's theorem. With some benefits on the side, and in another series of paper, and this was like between 2015 and 2017. Um, so here, together with uh, Emanuele Spadaro and Lucas Polar, what we've actually been able to do is to prove, so proof, of the existence of, say, Chunk's modification of Angren's theory, well, in a reasonable size. I mean, the size of a paper of some, say, 60, 70 pages. OK. but. Not only that, so in another series of joint works, and this is with um, Jonas Hirsch, Andrea Marchese, and Salvatore Stuvard. So this is essentially from 2017, 2018. OK, again, a theorem. And in this case, it's actually for G equals ZP. Again, the singular points where there are 
flat tangent cones are relatively few. Okay, and, and now this is all about interior regularity. So I've not actually touched on the case of boundary regularity. So in the case of boundary regularity, there is a similar situation. So there are some lucky situation. And again, a lucky situation is a situation in which the existence of a tangent half space guarantees regularity. Okay, and an unlucky situation where this is actually false. And what we've been able to do with some other, uh, um, what I've been able to do with some other researchers is actually to extend what Angren was doing in the interior, at least partially to this thing over here. Okay, so now I'm sorry because I'm going like a couple of minutes extra time, but like the plan for the next two lectures is Well, first of all, to give you an idea of why, so why is the problem of bounding the size of flat singular points so complicated? So secondly, what Angren's theory does, so what Angren's theory and our modifications do to tackle these problems And then third, and maybe most, most interesting, what, what we cannot do. So where or on which seemingly plausible open questions we are stuck and cannot progress further. Okay, and um, I'm sorry that it actually took me a couple of minutes more than I had forecasted, but um, this is all I wanted to tell you today. Well, let's thank Camilo for a beautiful panoramic talk.